You see, Albert Einstein, who did not like this probabilistic interpretation of the world, said, God does not play dice. But many decades later, Stephen Hawking came and said that God does play dice. In fact, he is a gambler. He likes to play dice all the time. Max Born actually took inspiration from Einstein himself. Because when Einstein was explaining the photoelectric effect, he also tried to combine the wave and the particle nature of photons. And Max Born took inspiration from that. You see, here I have a paper by Max Born himself. He writes that the idea of Einstein gave me the lead. He tried to make the duality of photons and waves comprehensible by interpreting the square of the optical wave amplitudes as probability density for the occurrence of photons. This concept could at once be carried over to the wave function square to represent the probability density. Well, let me explain what that means. If you A quick announcement for my students who are preparing for CSI Net Physical Sciences or Gate Physics. We at Elevate Classes organize live classes for these examinations every six months. The next batch is starting January. So this is a full-fledged live batch with live interactive classes, recorded access, test series and everything that you need. It's a complete package. So if you are interested, you can check out further details at elevateclasses.in. You can avail the early bird discount coupon which is available for the first 50 students. And if you're not really very sure about these online classes, then the first week of of lectures are free to attend upon registration. So elevate your physics preparation with Elevate Classes. Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Divya Jyoti Das and this is a Schrodinger's equation, the most fundamental equation in quantum mechanical theory. However, there is a slight problem in the equation. You see this iota term here? This iota is the imaginary number, root over minus one. So essentially, if I try to solve the Schrodinger's equation, which is a second order partial differential equation, then the solution of the Schrodinger's equation, which is essentially psi, I call this psi, which is a function of x and t, is a complex function. So the solution of the Schrodinger's equation is a complex function. So this is where naturally a question arises that what is this complex function? You see, we call this function as the wave function. You know, the solution of the Schrodinger's equation is called wave function. Now, if you have followed my previous lecture on how we can actually come up with the Schrodinger's equation from various arguments, then you must have uh, understood that the Schrodinger's equation is essentially a wave equation. And the solution of that wave equation is this wave function that governs the behavior of the matter waves of microscopic particles. You see, we know that microscopic particles have this wave particle dual nature. And to represent the matter wave behavior, we have this wave function solution. So the question is, what is the wave? that we are talking about. You see, when we talk about classical mechanics, when we talk about classical waves, for example, the waves on a string, then we are essentially talking about the displacement of the atoms on the string from its equilibrium position. It's an actual physical quantity. When we talk about sound waves, we are talking about the pressure differences propagating through the atmosphere. It's an actual physical quantity. When we talk about light waves as electromagnetic oscillations, we are talking about electric and magnetic fields propagating through space. We can actually measure electric and magnetic fields. So when we are talking about quantum particles and their wave equation and their wave solution, what is this wave actually? What is the physical quantity that we are talking about here? You see, the answer to that is not really that simple. And I know that many of the students, especially who are studying quantum mechanics for the first time, will probably spend a lot of time trying to imagine what this function actually is in terms of physical reality. But let me come straight to the point and give you the answer that this wave function does not represent anything physical. So in a way, the wave function being a complex function is actually a good thing because it straight away gets rid of the idea that this is anything physical in any way. Now, if you remember when we tried to come up with the Schrodinger's equation in my previous lecture using plausibility arguments, I used a wave equation for 
a free particle or I used a wave solution for a free particle and for a free particle I use this particular expression e to the power iota kx minus omega t. You see this is also a complex function. So when we are talking about a free particle, something that is not experiencing a force, that has a solution which is a complex mathematical function. So the question is, if the Schrodinger's equation gives us a complex mathematical function which has no physical significance, then what's the whole point of this procedure in the first place? Because at the end of the day, in physics, we are trying to come up with a theory to explain the physical world. If we cannot explain the physical world, then what's the point of all this? You see, the thing is not that simple. The quantum mechanical theory is a little bit more complicated compared to, let's suppose, classical theories. So, for example, if we talk about the classical physics or classical mechanics, one of the fundamental equations of classical mechanics is the Newton's second law, which is f is equal to ma, so or f is equal to m d2r upon dt2. Now, this is also a second order differential equation. And if I solve this second order differential equation, I end up getting rt, which is essentially the position vector. It basically gives us the exact position of the particle at any given point in time. And from there, I can calculate the velocity, I can calculate the momentum, I can calculate the kinetic energy, I can calculate the trajectory, etc, etc. However, in the quantum mechanical theory, if we solve the Schrodinger's equation, I get a mathematical function which has no direct physical significance, but it contains some information. It contains some information about the particle's position, particle's momentum, particle's energy, and we have to do some magic on this to reveal that information. And that is what the whole quantum mechanical theory is all about. We have to perform some mathematical operations onto this function so that we can extract that information out of this particular mathematical function. So in a way, the wave function solution of the Schrodinger's equation is a mathematical function. It's a computational device which contains some information that needs to be extracted via certain methods. And that is what this video is about in which I'm going to discuss one of the first things that we can deduce about this wave function which was given by Max Born in 1926 which is known as the Born's statistical interpretation. So Max Born in 1926 gave his Born's statistical interpretation which tells us that if I have a Schrodinger's equation for a physical system, I solve it, I end up getting a mathematical function, then that mathematical function gives us an idea about the probability density of where the particle can be found in that system. So for example, this is the function I have, and I solve the uh, Schrodinger's equation to get this function. So in that case, psi, which is a function of, let's suppose, x and t. By the way, I'm only dealing with the 1D version. That means I am accepting the limitation that the particle is maybe restricted to the 1D axis, the x-axis, just to simplify my calculations. So it's a function of x and t. And y, psi star is a complex conjugate because this is a complex function. It has a complex conjugate. This times psi basically gives us an idea about the probability density Okay, the probability density of where the particle can be found if we made a measurement on the system. So for example, I have a system in which a particle is restricted to the x-axis. I solve the Schrodinger's equation. I get some kind of a mathematical function. I take its mod square and I plot it in a graph. Let's suppose this is my graph. All right. So if this is my graph, and I'm just going to give you some sort of a random uh, distribution, okay? Something like this. I'm just taking a random guess where in the y-axis, you have the mod square of this wave function solution. In the x-axis, you have x. So the Born's statistical interpretation simply says that if at a given point in time, I make a measurement, 
then the probability that the particle can be found, let's suppose between two locations, x is equal to a and x is equal to b is given by the probability density which is psi star psi dx integrated between x is equal to a and x is equal to b. So the Max Bonds statistical interpretation gives us a tool to find out the probability of the particle being found in a given region when we solve the Schrodinger's equation. Now this is in sharp contrast with classical mechanics. You see in classical mechanics when we have an equation we solve it we actually get a physical quantity we get the trajectory we can predict if we know all the forces involved and all the initial conditions we can actually theoretically predict the accurate trajectory of the particle for all of time however in quantum mechanics even if we know everything that is to know about the system all it can tell us is a probability density of where the particle can be found. It cannot even exactly predict the most basic thing which is the exact position of a particle at a future point in time. The only thing quantum mechanics offers us is an idea of its probability distribution and this at the very beginning of our quantum mechanical theory introduces a fundamental difference in the way classical mechanics and quantum mechanics operate. So a classical mechanics essentially is deterministic. When I say deterministic, it means that it can theoretically determine the exact position of a particle at any given point in time as long as we know everything about the system. However, quantum mechanics on the other hand is indeterministic and by indeterministic I mean probabilistic. or probabilistic. Now, I can go so much into this particular difference in these two quantum mechanical and classical theories, but uh, I think it's kind of obvious that this kinds of creates a certain amount of uneasiness in whoever is studying this particular subject. This indeterminacy is deeply disturbing to many scientists, many philosophers and has been in the last hundred years uh, because it asks you a question. Is this how nature really works at its most fundamental level or is a quantum mechanical theory incomplete in some sense? You see Albert Einstein who did not like this probabilistic interpretation of the world said God does not play dice. But many decades later, Stephen Hawking came and said that God does play dice. In fact, he is a gambler. He likes to play dice all the time. Well, we will leave it up to future generations to conclude uh, that particular debate. But for the time being, the Bond statistical interpretation sets the stage for us to actually start the quantum mechanical theory in a right manner. That when we solve the Schrodinger's equation, we get a wave function solution and the wave function solution gives us a probabilistic interpretation. That means if I know the wave function solution, then if I make a measurement, then that measurement will give us a probability associated with the particle being found between any two locations. This is the theoretical prediction. Now keep in mind that the probability of the particle being found and the particle actually being found are two different things. That means this is the theoretical prediction of the Schrodinger's equation. But if I actually make a measurement, then it may turn out that the particle was maybe here. Okay, it's like uh, tossing a coin. So let's suppose that I have a coin and the coin has heads and it has tails. Before I toss the coin, theoretically I can say that it has 50% chance of being heads, 50% chance of being tails. But the moment I toss it, then 
it reveals itself to be, let's suppose, heads. And that is how quantum mechanics operates, that theoretically, I only have a probabilistic idea of where the particle may be found, or what is the probability associated with the particle being found somewhere. But the moment I make a measurement, the particle reveals itself to be somewhere maybe any one of these two points, right? It is a probability that is spread out. It's not like that the electron is 20% here, 40% here, 40% somewhere else. The particle itself is not spread out. It is a probability associated with the particle that is spread out. It is a wave function that has this wavy behavior. But the moment you make a measurement, the particle reveals itself to be at one location. So it is the act of measurement that is a fine line between the wavy nature of the theoretical prediction and the particle nature of the actual detection of the particle in a specific location. Now you might ask a question that what is it that inspired Max Born? to give this kind of a probabilistic interpretation of the solution of the Schrodinger's equation. Well, you'd be very surprised, but remember how I said that Einstein did not like the idea of a probabilistic interpretation of the world? Max Born actually took inspiration from Einstein himself. Because when Einstein was explaining the photoelectric effect, he also tried to combine the wave and the particle nature of photons. And Max Born took inspiration from that. You see, here I have a paper by Max Born himself. He writes that the idea of Einstein gave me the lead. He tried to make the duality of photons and waves comprehensible by interpreting the square of the optical wave amplitudes as probability density for the occurrence of photons. This concept could at once be carried over to the wave function square to represent the probability density. Well, let me explain what that means if you want to understand the inspiration behind Max Born. So let me rub this portion first. You see, when Einstein was trying to explain the photoelectric effect, he postulated that light, which are electromagnetic oscillations, consists of these quantized photons of energy or packets of energy. So we can think of light as waves, but we can also think of them as a bunch of photons that interact with electrons on a surface and transfer energy to the electrons. Now, when we look at this duality of whether the light is a wave or a photon, then one thing arises from this particular picture. If you want to talk about the energy of a light beam, all right, so let's suppose I'm interested in the energy. By intensity or energy, I mean that uh, how bright that particular light is, right? So if I want to say, okay, this light has more energy, it is more intense, right? Now in the classical framework, the energy or the intensity of a beam of radiation can be found out by the amplitude square of that particular wave. You see, when we talk about light being electromagnetic oscillation, there is a wave equation associated with the electric field. So when we solve the wave equation, we end up getting an electric field that is oscillating as the light beam propagates. And when we take the square of the amplitude of that electric field, we end up getting an idea about the intensity or we end up getting an idea about the energy in that particular wave. But Einstein simply said that that energy is equal to n h nu, where h nu is the packet of energy of a one photon and n is the number of the photons. Notice something very interesting here. This is the wave picture of the energy of a wave or the intensity of a wave being uh, the mod square of its amplitude. And this here, n, represents the number of particles. Number of particles. So when Einstein was trying to essentially resolve this problem of photoelectric effect, he introduced this idea that the waviness or the amplitude of the wave has something to do with the number of photons, I should say photons here, number of photons. It means that if you have a very intense light, then the energy of that light would be greater, the amplitude mod square will be greater, and the number of photons will be greater. If you have a less intense light or low energetic light, 
the amplitude mod square will be less and the number of photons will be less. This correlation between the amplitude mod square and the number of the photons gave Max Born the idea for a similar conclusion here that the solution of the Schrodinger's equation which gives us the mathematical wave function its mod square has something to do with how many number of electrons or particles can be found in that region which has to do with the probability density if we perform an experiment with a large number of particles or repeated experiments with the same particle. So this is the origin of the idea of a probabilistic interpretation. You see the person Albert Einstein who does not like the idea of a probabilistic interpretation was actually the source of the probabilistic interpretation as claimed by Max Born himself which is kind of uh, <laughs> interesting you know how things go about now if you have stuck with me till this point in time let me give you something more interesting all right this idea of the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function can also be used to explain the bizarre behavior of the double slit interference experiment. Remember the double slit interference experiment where electrons would create an interference profile? We can explain that using this concept here, okay? So if you have a bunch of electrons which are incident on, let's suppose, two slits, all right? bunch of electrons incident on two slits let's say one slit is s1 the other slit is s2 and i want to look at the pattern that i get on the other side okay let's suppose so i have one pattern here i have uh, one pattern here and i have another pattern here now if only s1 is open if only s1 is open i might get some sort of a distribution of electrons like this all right and if only s2 is open i might get a distribution of electrons on the other side something like this but what if both s1 and s2 are open then i get a very interesting result which may look something like this an interference pattern these consecutive dark and bright fringes or distribution of the electron and that is something that we can kind of correlate from this idea because when we have just one slit open then this intensity of the electrons on the other side is given by psi 1 mod square so let's suppose i call it the probability p1 is given by psi 1 mod square which is basically equal to psi 1 star psi 1 right when only s2 is open then we have the probability distribution is psi 2 mod square which is basically psi 2 star psi 2 but what if both s1 and s2 are open in that situation when both s1 and s2 are open i get a probability which is not the sum of p1 plus p2 no it is basically the mod square of psi 1 plus psi 2. So let's suppose psi 1 is the wave function solution for the Schrodinger's equation when electrons only pass through slit S1. And psi 2 is the wave function solution for the Schrodinger's equation when electrons only pass through S2. Now because psi 1 and psi 2 are essentially solutions of this particular system, then I can perform a superposition of these wave function solutions. That is a property of this kind of a differential equation. When I do that, this essentially gives me a very interesting solution that you have psi 1 star plus psi 2 star times psi 1 plus psi 2. And if we look at this particular term, let me write it here because there is uh, no space there. So this simply gives me psi, this simply gives me psi 1 star, psi 1 star plus psi 2 star, psi 2 star plus I have psi 1 star, psi 2 plus psi 2 star, psi 1. So essentially I have Again, I'm going in the left, okay? I'm going towards the left. I end up getting psi 1 star, uh, psi 1, sorry, psi 1 star psi 1, which is essentially probability P1 
psi 2 star psi 2 which is essentially probability p2 and then these two terms psi 1 star psi 2 plus psi 2 star psi 1. So essentially the probability when both the slits are open is not equal to just p1 and p2 but there is this additional term. It is this additional term that introduces the oscillations that we end up seeing here. All right. If we had the classical explanation, then this would not be possible. It is because we have this probabilistic interpretation of the wave function, then the wave functions can get added up that I actually end up getting the probability distribution for a double slit to contain these terms that will explain this kind of an interference profile. So having a probability density as the explanation for the mod square of psi, which is a solution of the Schrodinger's equation, sets the stage for the right interpretation or the right framework of study for quantum mechanics, which was of course first provided by Max Born and therefore known as the Born statistical interpretation. So this is just the beginning. All right. What other information can we found, find out from this psi? And in fact, what is psi? There is a lot of information hidden in psi and that is going to be my focus in the coming lectures. So that is all for today. Right now, in the coming lectures, we're going to talk more about this particular wave function and what other information we can extract and what magic we can perform here. All right. I'm Divya Das. This is For the Love of Physics. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.